Welcome everybody to the Lure Fishing Podcast. This is episode 24. Before we crack on, just would like to say a big thank you to everybody that watched last week's episode. Something completely different as we were looking at the first four episodes of the YPC UK Bank Series competition. I think that kind of format went down really well and we're going to revisit that a bit later on into the YPC UK Series. And I've got more footage that won't be seen and one or two more anecdotes which... I think it would be fair to share. So keep an eye out for that one. What do we have in this week's episode? Well, I managed to collar Dave Morris. So I've got a a section with Dave Morris who is explaining everything kayak and kayak angle of the year 2024. And in there, we've got one or two special pieces where he's actually given away some competition information that isn't available anywhere else. And we have got the dates for the Coyote 2024 competitions. We've also got the weekly contributions from Charlie and Bradley. I'll be dropping those in somewhere poignant in this podcast. But first, try to imagine that you are a lure builder. And just imagine how many questions you get asked on a daily and weekly basis by customers. Now, some of these questions could be quite unique, but I imagine a lot of these questions are very, very similar. I filmed a short section with Tom Tom's highlighted some of the questions he gets asked a lot, and we thought we'd broach the subject here. To start off with, let's go straight to Tom Moyer. Right, guys, Tom's a really busy guy, and I do feel a bit conscientious of nicking his time because he's obviously he, he spends 36 hours and 24 hour days making lures and packages and sending them, out, sending them out. So I thought for this little slot, we'd actually try and catch him in the lure lab. So, Tom, thanks for joining us. You're welcome. I'm taking a seat. I haven't seen one of these in ages. Oh, bless you. So, um, well, stand. You can have you not got a standing bench or workstation? Workstation. Oh, isn't that the in thing at the minute? Have one of those uh, on an actuator. It goes up and down. Oh, pump those squats. Pump those squats. <laughs> right, where where are we going with this? Let's stop before we get off track. Just, <laughs> yeah, just go mad. Okay, right, guys. We we have done a little bit of homework. I'll just preempt this because it's only to be fair. What what we thought we'd do? We'd um, do something slightly different because we quite like the magazine approach, don't we, for the podcast? So that's why we thought we'd do this. So, Tom, you've thrown me some questions, haven't you? Yeah, it's um, it's pretty much it's a bit of a selfish thing actually because I get asked a lot, a lot of questions. And it, a lot of them are the same. So if we can put them all in one place, how awesome would that be? Yeah, I don't think it's selfish at all. I think the more that people hear the answers that will help them in their lure fishing, the better it is. So, yeah. So I mean, usually my answers, but they're just my answers. It's how I do it and how you do it. But it's, it's knowledge, isn't it? Yeah, well, we've got... So I'll, I'll ping you the questions and we'll go through your answers. And we've got one at the end that we'll kind of both share. But... um. Yeah. No, I think these are good because uh, I think um, I, I kind of roughly know what you're going to say because we have had we do chat about really boring shit most of the time, don't we? So we have discussed all this a million times uh, over the last two or three years. So, but what you're saying is basically very, very good advice. Okay, let's kick off straight into it. So, um, what size lure do you recommend for perch? Depends on the perch. Now, if I want numbers. I'm going for anything 50 mil, two inch and under, and that's my numbers game. If I want that slightly better specimen, then I'm going up to 75 mil, which is three inches. So that's that's where I'm going with that. So for lots of numbers, anything under 50 mil, and for a bit more of a specimen size, up to about three inches, sometimes bigger, but I don't really see the, feel the need for it. Cool. Now this is the eternal question. <laughs> what colours do you use? Personally, if you were to take away any sort of colours, I would want a green pumpkin based and a dark colour. My green pumpkin based colour is electric green pumpkin. That's my favourite. Um, it's a green pumpkin with small blue glitter. Uh, it just gives that little bit of shine to it. And then the other one is my dark colour, which is June bug. I will add a bright colour to that. Nine times out of ten, those are the two lures, those two colours that I'm throwing, and that gets the job done 99% of the time. Cool. Um, now, this next question, I know drives you insane. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I know what people, this one is. <laughs> people will send Tom a picture of a bait and go, what size hook do I use for that? Yeah. Yeah. 
So, well, so I can't really think of a better way of asking the question than kind of visually trying to explain it like that. Well, the thing, I, I started the same as everyone else did. I bought a lot of lures and a lot of hooks. And so from an FFS lures point of view, that's why I've, I put a hook recommenda recommendation chart on it. However, if you're fishing something like a, a, a two and a three, two and three quarter inch TRD, I'm going to say it. If you're fishing something like that, you want, and I'm talking EWGs here. So EWG wise, you want a size one or a size two EWG. If you're fishing a shrimp. What does EWG mean, Tom? Extra wide gap or gape. So that okay. is the that's an ex hook. Yeah, let's have an extension. Extra. So that's all right. I put in then. Go yeah. on. So if you're fishing and then the original shrooms head, which went with these two and three quarter inch lures, that's a size two on a J hook. So an exposed hook pattern, that's a size two. So if you use those as your guide, for me, I just bought for EWGs, I would have a selection of size four, size two, size one. And then for jig heads, I don't really fish them much, but if I would do, I'd get a lot of size two, a lot of size ones, and if I'm going very small, size six. Cool. Well, that's a good answer. But I think um, yeah, Tom, use Tom's lures, use his hook chart. Can't, you cannot go wrong. It's a really good idea. Um, oh, another eternal question here. If you could only use one lure, which one would it be? Uh, 75 mil floating finesse stick. That. That is on, uh, yeah, that's on a Texas because with a Texas, you can slide that weight back and use something to peg it. It could be a little twig. It could be anything. So then you've got a Carolina. So that's versatile. If you then push that weight down against the hook and peg it the other way, so make something stick in the hole so it doesn't move, that's your jig head. And then the FFS, because it's floating, it's going to sit up nice. But if you fish it weightless, you can use it as a top water. If you slash the air cavity, it's now a sinking bait. So it is for, for something that is so simple, it is so versatile. So if you were to take away everything from me and just give me one option, that's it. That's a great answer. I like that one. Okay. Um, this is kind of like, so when I was a teacher, right, we'd um, set the kids questions and then we'd have extension questions that were harder. This for bonus thing. But this is your extension question. Okay. Um, and it sounds simple, but it's not. How do you fish your drop shot? Because a lot of people fish your drop shot, don't they? And they literally are chucking it into one small space and yeah. holding it there and just putting a, making the bait just vibrate slightly. I wonder yeah. if you fished it a different way. The – oh, so put the cup down. Ooh, two hands. Uh, <laughs> drop shot for me is just a suspended lure. So I fish it as if I would a jig head. So if I'm bouncing along the bottom with a jig head, but I now want a presentation where that lure is up here, it's drop shot. And therefore my technique is exactly the same. So I will cast out to the same spots that I would cast to uh, using a jig head or a Texas or a chair or anything else. But the nice thing about the drop shot is that when you move it and it goes still, you drop that rod tip down, that lure will flutter to the bottom like a dying thing. And then when you pull up to get that the line tight with the weight, it's like that, it's that death throw of a fish where it does go, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm alive, oh, no, I'm not, I'm dying again. So you've got that. I also tie on my drop shot weights now. I know it's crazy talk, but- No, that's what I do. Yeah, I found that the amount of time that I actually changed that length compared to the amount of drop shot weights I lost, there was no point in using one of those drop shot weights that slides up and down. Because if I, I, saw, I, I was looking at my PC screen a minute ago, because it was flashing at me, I'm thinking, oh my God, what's happening? That's what I was looking over there. <laughs> Do you know what? That's really interesting you say that, because I've started using swan shot. Yeah. And I'll tell you why, is when I hit a snag, the swan shot pull off the line. Yeah. And my um, leader doesn't snap. Yeah. So that's... So I used because I'm tight, I used to fix the drop shot weight like you do now. Yeah. So I tie a loop and put the loop through that little, I don't know what you call it, that little strange shape thing that you trap. Yeah, Most like, people trap oh, the line, is that? Yeah. I put the loop through and just look and take it around the weight so it doesn't come off. Yeah. But I was discovering, particularly in very snaggy areas, the drop shot weight was catching in snags and I was actually breaking 
the uh, the leader material. So now I use Swan Shot, and they actually pull off. The the other thing, so that's if I'm fishing like the super ultra like drop shot, split shot, absolutely perfect. And I'm fishing fine diameter lines. You know, I'm talking that oh, was it 0.19 fluorocarbon? But I'm also fishing that sort of thing, and I'm using fluorocarbon as a main line. So if I do get any issues, I'm not tying leaders. I'm just tying. I'm, it's just I've got yeah. a leader that is 50 meters long because yeah. I'm using fluorocarbon as a main line. You still get the mm -hmm. same bite registration and everything else, especially if you're, you're feeling the the blank. That line's going to make that blank vibrate if you get a fish on or fish bite um but the other thing as well is that someone said to me this to me the other day about swan shot because it was a very general drop shot question but i also drop shot for xander and i'm drop shotting 10 centimeter 14 centimeter lures for xander and i might be using 14 grams or 20 grams as drop shot weight so there i'm just getting an Aussie bomb you know I'm, yeah. not, <laughs> I'm, I'm chucking that out and if it gets snagged up, I might ping it out, but chances are when it's five kilo line, 10 pound line, that knot's going to go first. But I don't really lose much, touch everything, um, when I'm fishing that sort of power BFS. I think just made that up. Power. <laughs> power. Oh, power can't, can't put BFS and power well, together in the same Power drop shot. Sorry, power drop shot. <laughs> Okay, mate. That's that's a really good answer, and I hope you know we, we don't we don't want to make this section too long because we 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 could talk for hours on one thing, so yeah. we have to be careful. Right, last question, mm -hmm. uh, and I think we'll both share this one because yeah. we've both got probably similar very, probably very similar views. Because I think a lot of people seem to think that they use a shad as a search technique first. And my question, so the question is, do you use a search technique when perch fishing? No. Hmm. What do you do? I search. I, I search with what I'm using, because I never got the I never got the hang of this. I never got the thought process of I want to find something and then change to something. I want to find it with this and then change to that. If I find it with that and they're biting that, I'm going to use that. So I cut out that middleman. Exactly. So, Why yes. did you change something you've just caught? Yeah, I don't get it. I don't get it. Some right. people say, oh, you find the small fish and then you go more finessey and you catch the bigger fish in the shoal. But I've never really done that. I might as well just go for the big fish first off. So if I'm if I'm searching, if I'm doing a water, I am doing a fan cast, whether it be a drop shot or a Texas, I'm doing that fan cast. Any interest, I'm staying there. No interest, I'm moving on. Because you know these yeah. big areas, this fence, if, if you're you can be 500 meters off a fish. And if you're mm. in that long place because the wind has now made it the water go that way. Or they've turned the pump on, it's going that way. The fish are just bomb bursting everywhere. So where they were yesterday, they're not there tomorrow. Exactly. And I think you've got to use a technique that you think is correct for that time of year, and then you refine it as you're going along in that session. That's what I yeah. do anyway. Yeah. And uh, I'll use that as my, my, my the, the method that I'm using, I'll use as my search technique. And if it's not working as well as I thought it would do, I'll try something else, but I'll still right. use that as a search technique because. Yeah. Yeah, I can't. I can't get my head around when people say, "Oh, you use a shad first to find them." I'm thinking, yeah, and then change. Mm, uh, yeah. Why would you use a shad if it's not going to work? Yeah, it's a bit like a shad yeah. I, 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 I often use a drop shot as my search because yeah, I know it's going to work, and I can feel the stuff on the bottom, and then it gives you that option that if you do find a snag, you can then work that snag when you found it. Whereas if I'm <laughs> fishing a, yeah. a crank and it now gets hung up in that snag. It's it's done. <laughs> it's it really. I'm going to use a crankbait to catch them. Exactly. To find them. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's, and also, it's, drop shot this time of year, you can fish it quick. Quick, yeah. Even in even in depths of winter, I yeah. rarely fish it in one spot and shake yeah. it. So if I yeah. if I do pause, I do. I, I just drop that rod tip now, and that moves it there, and it does something. But after that, yeah. it's moved again. So the fish has had its chance. Yeah. <laughs> to, to exactly. Yeah. Point. It's had its chance. In, yeah, it? that's interesting. Um, we're not saying we're right, but it's, it's no. amazing how we have very similar answers from coming from different angles of this. Right, Tom, I'm conscious of time because this is a small section. I didn't want it to be too long. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and I know you're really busy. You've got another 357 million lures to make today. So, uh, yeah, packaging, packaging today. Awesome. <laughs> I, don't, 
Yeah, and uh, I know you've been in touch with a, a, a not, we're not going to say too much, a news publication. Yes, yes. Well, by the time this comes out, that, that's going to be nearly there, I think. Cool. Well, uh, there, we'll, so. uh, when it when it comes to fruition, we'll um, highlight it on the next podcast. Awesome. awesome. Perfect. Brilliant. Right, buddy. I'm going to leave this and we're going to head off somewhere else. Who knows where? Wherever you go, enjoy it. Will do. <laughs> See you later. <laughs> Ta-da. Joking apart, hopefully you picked up one or two tips there from those questions that I ran through with Tom. Now, Dave Morris, who is he? What's his background? I have the answers for you. So Dave Morris is one of those wonderful people that organises these events around the country. But he's also a very, very good kayak angler. So let's go straight to Mr. Morris. Right, guys, you've got to imagine the scene. So it must have been, I think, two or three years ago, I was trying to get into these boat comps. And I saw this guy in the boat very close to me. It was at Rutland. I can't remember which, which competition it was, but this guy had this big black box with loads of batteries and was extending the virtue of live scope. And Dave Morris, that's probably the first time we've ever had a proper chat, was actually loading boats at Rutland before a comp. I think it was one of the late challenges two or three years ago. It I was. don't know if you remember this. Yeah, it was late challenge. Um, I can remember it quite well. Yeah, you came up to me and said... What's that all about? I'd like to yeah. know. It. Yeah, I did. Yeah, yeah. and uh, you were you were brilliant because um, then we st struck up a little uh, sort of a friendship then and there. And you um you were you were great. You helped me out loads with a uh, Garmin uh, Life Scope advice, and uh, that's how I got my Garmin Life Scope. So thank you very much for that. No problem at all. That was cool. Anyway, that's not the reason why we got you on today. We're not talking about tech per se. We're talking about um you how you got into lure fishing and also your involvement with um coyote because you are the organizer for the coyote events and obviously on the last few podcasts we've been talking more and more about kayaks because um i believe it's one of the biggest branches of the sport that's really up and coming and it's very exciting with all the the, the new things that are happening within lure fishing but also kayaks are providing that that extra edge that oh, i think gives us more access to waters that boats probably don't, but we'll talk about that later. So really what I wanted to know first, Dave, is who is Dave Morris and how did he get into lure fishing? Right, Dave Morris, um, I'm, I'm the owner of Anglers Afloat, which is an information site for kayak anglers. I've uh, been kayak fishing since 2003. Um, it's it's uh, shortly after that, I started, uh, I was sponsored by Ocean Kayak. They uh, sent a few of us off to America in 2010 to compete in our first uh, tournament. Um, and the idea of that was to come back and try and start a tournament series or a tournament in the UK, which turned out to be the Swanage Classic. I was part of that for 10 years, ran it for the final six years on my own. And then while I was doing that, I decided that I didn't have enough of salt water fishing and bait comps. I was interested in lure fishing. I did a bit of lure fishing and I fancied doing a series for Hobie. Um, I'd been to the Hobie Worlds in Australia. I'd been to the Hobie Worlds in, in Texas, in the USA, fishing for bass. And there was no way for any of the guys in the UK to actually qualify for an event. So I spoke to Steve and said, look, Steve, we need to... Uh, ought to start thinking about doing a series in the UK and get some qualifiers going, talk to Hobie and see what they think. So uh, that was about 2017, 2018. 2019, we started to develop the series. And uh, 2020, obviously COVID time, we went live with the first series, um, hoping that Anglian Waters would allow us to go out on the water. But every time we attempted it, we got locked down. So 2020 was a was a complete whitewash. Well, just so to backtrack a little bit, then you, you you got into kayaks very early doors, didn't you? Yeah, was you probably a... there was probably about 20 guys doing it back then. And were you more of a bait angler back then? 2003. It was, it was all bait. Yeah, you chuck a lure around. I mean, the first meet there was six of us um, down in Exeter, and uh, we were chucking chucking lures around, um, but didn't really have an idea of what we were doing. We just caught a few Pollock. Um, it right. was quite interesting. Um, so was it estuary base or inland shore? No, off, offshore, offshore. Offshore fishing. Yeah, so uh, the vast majority of angling at, at, at that time was guys going offshore right up until probably 
yeah, 2010, I would say. Most of the guys were fishing the sea. All the comps were based around the sea. After that, um, all the interest and all the friendships grew around anglers fishing at sea. Wow. So it's all paddle kayaks. All paddle kayaks, yeah. And started fishing with bait, and then the lures crept in, and then I suppose took over, did they, to a degree? That, that started the... the I was probably one of the first, I was one of the first of three pedal kayakers, uh, anglers in 2012 when I joined Hobie. Oh, were you um, despised? And we were despised. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they tried to block us from tournaments. Um, <clears throat> it wasn't, it, we weren't liked at all. Um, yeah. A lot of mockery. Uh, I had the first PA as well. To, and that was, that was launched into the middle of, of a lake once by some friends because they, said it had no place to be there uh but it just floated back in again caught the wind and just drifted back to me it was like it was a homing pigeon the reason i mentioned that is when i spoke to steve at grafham he was talking to me about this uh, and also when i went to see him uh, um their base in in paul that um yeah there was a bit of bit of bit of ag wasn't there uh, amongst yeah. the kayakers between when these <laughs> foot drives first came in and it was yeah. deemed as not kayaking am i correct in the that's season? right yeah 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 we were very much thought of a pedalos uh interestingly all the guys all the guys that that mocked it well 99 percent of the guys that were mocking it at the time now have a hobby um right yeah and uh yeah there's just one character that's kind of dwindled away now um he's he's that that hasn't changed over to hobie which is quite incredible really well you see i come from the complete other end of the spectrum with this all i come from um boat lure fishing and I want to get into uh, a kayak that enables me to fish efficiently. Mm. So a pedal-driven um, Hobie kayak that has a 360 capability is like, well, a bit of a no-brainer, really. I don't yeah. want a paddle, do I? It gets in the way. I just yeah. have it there like a, a, a safety feature or like a bit of a secondary bit of propulsion in case I need a, to, to get myself out of a bit of difficulty. So you have a single bladed paddle in the back of the kayak just stowed away but uh so i come from the other end of the spectrum of it so to hear all these stories is quite funny really because um i i can sit because it happens doesn't it in all walks of life there's there's this is the way we do it and it cannot change mm, exactly and, uh, but um we have to allow um things to develop and progress yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. so um oh that was funny so you 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 were a troublemaker then really not, yeah, I, try, I try not to cause any trouble, but yeah, it was, um, yeah, it wasn't, really wasn't liked very much at all. Um, but yeah, it has been an, a very interesting development and, uh, the last 12 years have been, yeah, brilliant. It's brilliant to see it, to be honest. I mean, it's most of the guys are, are fishermen first, kayakers second, yeah. um, and it gives us hands-free fishing. It doesn't matter which brand you're using um hands-free fishing is definitely the way to go especially if you're lure fishing or fly fishing it yes. really is yeah what you yeah, need you can't... it's it's the best tool yeah okay so let's fast forward then so you um you were then spearheading really this kayak fishing in the country and then we, particularly because the lures would have come in and then you you went more uh fresh water when did that kind of diversion take place when Ooh. did you kind of see that split yeah that wasn't probably six years six years ago maybe not right, that long okay. ago i mean no. if, if we ever did a tournament abroad it would be fresh water so the hobie series were always fresh water so um yeah it, it's that's where it came from if you wanted to if we wanted to develop the sport we needed to develop it more into fresh water which is a, a major problem really in the uk um a big big problem so getting access to waters Terry Wright, um, who's who's now retired from kayak fishing, he was uh, he spearheaded getting us onto Anglian water. He he was trying to get us access for crikey five years probably before we were able to get on there. And he he just wore the guys down. I think to be honest, he just worked really hard. Um, mm. and we we have him to thank for for getting us on all of the Anglian waters. Oh, I remember Anglian water when I first had a an old transom bow electric motor. They did mm. not want it on the boats. Yeah. Their theory was that the battery was too close to the petrol tank and it would catch fire. <laughs> <laughs> this was yeah. 18 years ago. 
yeah, a long yeah. time ago. <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, so that, yeah, you had all these little battles. There weren't battles, but it was like, what? Now mm. I've got it. Batteries in the battery box. It's all secure. It's never going to spark. If it does, it's contained. Uh, anyway, yeah. So obviously that they then allowed those on, but it was like that was a big milestone. But it was a huge step for lower anglers because you could control the control the boat slightly, yeah. rather than just being at the mercy of the wind and using the drogue. So I can imagine um, the guy you mentioned trying to get kayaks on because the health and safety would have driven them insane. It's like, oh my god, we can't allow those on, even yeah. though. Um, Angling waters have all the yacht clubs on there anyway, and kayak schools and blah blah blah. So it was kind of hold on a minute, but there's a bunch of kids just rowing across the lake. Mm. What's the difference? So yeah, it's all these battles. But now, well, you see, because I remember the boat comps when I started seeing the kayaks turning up, and I'm poop in my head, poo pooing them, going, mm. "What are these guys doing? They're going out in these little plastic tubs. It's not the same. They've got no chance." And I think in the last two years, I've kind of gone, "Wow." These kayaks are really good. Hmm. They're decked out the same as boats. Um, the, the fish aren't scared of the presence of the kayak compared to the boat. The boat engines don't massively affect the fish as well. You can see the fish um, reacting to boat engines. Yeah. And watching the guys, particularly in the Xander comp, smashing the boats, you're kind of going, wow. There's obviously it's a lot going on here with the kayaks that needs to be explored. So it's, um, it's great that Angling Water have allowed these the kayaks on. But also that people are pushing the boundaries. I know Goody had the um, the first elite pro comp on the River Yeah a few months ago. Yep. Few months, that was good, wasn't it? Very and good. yeah, and I think now it's um, we'll talk about how you're pushing Cody next year, how you're ch- pushing the boundaries a bit in a minute. But um, basically, um, because it's technically a canoe, access is a lot easier than a boat, isn't it? Really, to get your kayak onto waters. Yeah. So, and I think now um, with the right-minded people. There could be all sorts of competitions all over the country. So um, we'll see what happens over the next two or three years. But we have to thank people like yourself, Dave, because you are brilliant. You're the organisers who do all these events, and it's bloody hard work, isn't it? It is. It is. It's a lot of work behind the scenes. Um, Since I've announced the dates for Coyote, I've had a lot of nagging, people wanting to know information, um, wanting to know about the prizes next year, uh, how many fish they're going to be catching. Um, Yeah. Before we get on to that, should we just do a little recap of Cody then? So you spoke to Steve, who is the, the main importer, for, well, the only importer, I suppose, for Hobie, isn't he, in this country? Yeah, there's a, there is another company that brings them in. But Steve Steve's the Steve has, has spearheaded the tournaments with us. He's, he's, uh, he promotes all the tournaments. He sponsors nearly all the tournaments in the UK. He's, he's been brilliant. Brilliant. Yeah, um, yeah. So, I know with the last one, he, that la- was it a laser, the kayak? Was it oh, the, no, the links, the links, the links. Sorry, yeah. so he he paid for half the links, didn't he? Probably, yeah, yeah. Money. Uh, for yeah. The, the, sorry, I'm not explaining this very well. So, kayak angler of the year this year got a links kayak, yeah, it's a three grand kayak, and he he yeah. put half, half it in himself and his company just yeah. to get that this prize across. And I think that was that just shows the support that he's obviously given um, the coyote competitions over the last few years. So, obviously, you've worked closely with him. So, you made the decision to start these comps, did you say 2020? 2019 we had the we we started to mess about with the format to formulate it yeah uh 2020 was when we tried to do the first series um but that didn't come off and then so 2021 was our first actual year where we could all compete right okay. um, cool. and those years we we were giving away a garmin life scope to at every event wow yeah that's a big prize isn't it yeah as well yeah okay so and where were the, so I don't, I don't know. So the, did you hold the events on the angling water reservoirs mainly to start off with? Yes. Yeah. So right. it was uh, Rutland. We do a Pittsford, start off in Pittsford. Yeah. Then uh, in, in May, um, then off to uh, Rutland as soon as it opened. And then the following month we'd be on Grafham. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we did that for the first two years. Um, and then last year, uh, well, this year, sorry, this year we decided to add another venue. We wanted a saltwater venue. Um, had a good look around of where we could actually go. Uh, there's already comps at Oxwich and Swanage, which are both very safe venues. Um, you can fish them in nearly any conditions, to be honest. Uh, so then we wanted to knock those two on the head and try somewhere else. So Christchurch, there's been a few comps in the past on Christchurch in the harbour. Um, great launching, uh, nice, safe 
place to fish. Um, you can fish it in practically any conditions again. So that's what we did for, for this year. We entered, uh, we brought in a, a saltwater tournament, which was uh, re nicely received by a few anglers that don't do the other comps. Um, so again, for 2024, we'll have Christchurch in there again. I suppose also a consideration is when, you've, when you're when you organising anything, you need to be wary of uh, the, the British weather. So if you're having a part of one of the legs in salt water, it needs to be somewhere whereby, yeah, you've got to have something that's pretty much protected. So with the weather and the wind in particular, I suppose Christchurch is great because it is a very sheltered area to fish. Yeah. 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 And if, if it kicks up, you can walk to shore, to be honest. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it sounds, it sounds a very, very good location and safety has to be paramount, paramount, doesn't it? So um, exactly. that's a good idea. OK, so then so should we, before we go on to this year, the 2024, should we just recap the winners from the last three years? Because yep. uh, the only reason I know is because I was with you actually in Grafham when we were filming the, um, the presentation. So Richard Archer won the 2023, didn't he? Yes, he did. Yeah. Yeah. So it was, uh, he's, is he fairly new time. to the sport? Uh, he's been around. Everybody thinks he's new, but he has been around. I was looking through some old photographs and Richard pop, little head pops up in the background, <laughs> very quiet. Um, and he sort of, he's slowly slithered in and, uh, and, and come to the, to the front and he's, he's doing exceptionally well. He's, he's, he's very focused. Um, yeah, he's, he's, yeah, he's one of the major players now done a great cool. job. Cool. So he was this year's winner. Who, who won it? 2022. 22 was Martin Collison, uh, Team England. He's uh, he's one of the uh, the uh, world champions from uh, 2022. Cool. Uh, in Portugal, and uh, in 2021 it was Andy Dugan, who's also Team England, and also a world champion. From Perfect. So you've created a bit of heritage there, haven't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a few, uh, quite a few of the anglers now that are at the top um, are Team England anglers, which is uh, is brilliant. Yeah, um, yeah, it's good. And yeah, it, but it doesn't mean that they're going to win all the time. I mean, Richard's not in Team England yet, but he won this year. He's yeah. put the effort in. Effort is reward. Yes, it is, and you've you don't win these things unless you put in lots of practice sessions and work out what you're doing. So that's exactly. a, that's good. Okay, so let's let's. I suppose there's a few people watching this and will want to get onto the next bit. So what's the plan for two thousand and twenty four, Dave? Okay, for twenty twenty four, we're going to introduce two river sessions. So there's this. The first one will be in March on March the 9th, and that'll be fishing for perch. The river editions. You can fish anywhere that you want. We wanted to open it up to everybody, so everybody has access to a river somewhere. They may not have fished it. If you can get a kayak on it, they can fish the tournament. Keeps the costs down, um, and hopefully it will increase numbers greatly. There's been quite yeah. a bit of interest in this. Uh, it's it's made us all think. I mean, I fish with uh, Mark Radcliffe a fair bit. And we fish on sections of the Thames that we're very well, we, we, we know very well. But then we start to think, well, where are we going to catch a series of five, five or more big perch? And then you start to think, well, we might pull one out in a session, but we don't push and pull any more than that. But we don't actually target the perch. We only ever fish for the chub or the pike, to be honest. So have you set a limit now? What's, what's the card for the ninth? Do you know? Okay, you I'm gonna, I, I wasn't going to announce it until the new year, but I will announce it now. The, the card Ooh. for the perch editions will both be five. So right, five okay. perch. Um, and then for the chub edition, it'll be five chub. Again, five big chub yeah. is a hell of a card. You might get one, you might get two. And then finding another three is going to be quite hard work. So... Big numbers, and I hope it will mix it up a little bit. If we did it as three, I think it would be a little bit too easy for some people. Yeah, I think five, five is a good number. I think you, you well, I'm not telling you what to do, but at least five for the perch. It makes it more. You people have got to go to venues that you're not, they're not going to. Some people have banker spots for one or two big fish, and that doesn't actually help them, does it? Be five. Or no, one. no. It's, you want to go somewhere. You've got to push the boundaries and actually do exploring, which is good. And five chub, just catching five chub in a session is going to be quite tricky. Yeah. Yeah. Is there a minimum size as well? Um, we 
I've not decided yet. There's a possibility okay. for the perch there will be. Yeah. Um, so well, people know. It will, be, it will be a small one. It will be probably 20 centimetres for both. Yeah. What I was going to say is, um, is there a, what, is there the information going to go out from a specific site? So if everyone it'll can get all, there's a, there's a Coyote um, Facebook page. Yeah. And it'll also be on the Anglers Afloat Facebook page. Um, we'll, we'll cover so that at the end of the time. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Well, that's exciting stuff. Now, obviously, you, you're hoping that one or two people don't go and cheat because sadly there are one or two people who just want to cheat. Yeah. God. Well, think that's that's been that's a that's a big worry for a lot of the competitors. Is is yeah. and I've already had had phone calls about it. How are you going to stop the cheating? Mm. Um. Well, you you can't really as a as a we've run a lot of competitions and a, a lot of the salt water comps we had people suggesting that people were cheating um we did have one person that uh, had a good go um, <laughs> pre pre-baited uh, an area at swanage massively he, he lived locally um and then he he wrote on the boy private keep off i'd been given the heads up locally that this had happened and and i just told them at the briefing everybody at the briefing that there some of the boys out there might have some bait underneath it it's a free game for all if it's got private ignore it everybody can go and have a go and that's somebody beat into his boy that, isn't it why would you want to do that um but again that was there was there was a garmin lifescape up for grabs at that event and um yeah and some of the yeah. some of the other salt water comps we've had uh, again Sh sure thing steve beard he put up several kayaks over the years yeah as first prizes um and ocean kayak did the same before so, right um, yeah there's always one or two people but i think with the um clutch of the clutch of people i don't know if that's the correct terminology that i yeah. see at um the angling water comps the, the kayakers you all seem to be incredibly sociable mm. so I, I you can say that none of those guys there are even thinking about that but it's people it, there are sadly one or two of people who um uh they just want a bit of fame and fortune don't they five minute mm. wonders but um yeah let's hope everybody plays by um the rules and i'd imagine 99 percent of people as in life will do but uh as the organizer you're trying to push the boundaries and something like this i think is a really good idea and you just have yeah. to rely on people doing it properly yeah i mean we'll we'll have um the, the measures are going to have to be specific manufacturers measures or um a specific tape that we're going to use that somebody can an adhesive measure so we'll know that they're size measurement wise they are perfect yeah um, yeah uh so there'll be three probably that i'll allow yeah uh, so. you see people can go out the day before put fish in keep nets they can use worms they can do all sorts of dark yeah. things can't they? but um we just have to rely on people doing the right thing i suppose also another thing was to try and encourage people to go out in pairs one for safety and two um yeah it, it lessens the chance doesn't it of people doing know, some, some some guys just won't want to give up their their secret spots oh. <laughs> you know how it is i mean it's yeah. Mark and I have got a, a spot for the chub, um, which we had a pair of six pounders out, two casts, and we won't divulge where that is. But we've never caught another chub since out of that spot. Not not a big one. Yeah. Um, but it's it's the Thames. They change the levels. They open the weirs. They should close the weirs a little bit, and it just changes yeah. the flow completely. Yeah. And uh, yeah. So my chub spot is about six miles long. Yeah, is it? <laughs> You're a very lucky man. <laughs> yeah, I mean, got one. no, there's it's, it's not solid with them. There might be oh, one right. or two in the six oh, okay. miles. It's literally, I average. I think I was averaging 0.75 fish in the summer. Yeah. So uh, I can't use that as a venue to catch five from because it won't happen. Yeah. <laughs> but that's find... that's the challenge of this that you put. You've, this is a good idea, isn't it? It's um. Yeah. We yeah. we did find a, a mark last year, um, and there was twenty or thirty chub sitting on it hmm. just sitting there I'm, I'm guessing they were they were spawning but post spawn yeah yeah um and uh yeah you could you could pull a couple off off of there before they disappeared hmm. and then when they disappeared they disappeared yeah they weren't having anything i think it'd be, it's gonna be good it's, 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 a, it's a right challenge as well hmm. okay so that the 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 perch oh. comp is the 9th of march what was the date yeah. again of the chub one yeah, so hold on. Uh, Christchurch would be second, and that's on the 15th of June. 
Sorry, so, yeah, it's going to order. Yeah. 15th of June's Christchurch. And is that yeah, and uh, it's be, a one day? Yeah, it's a one day. That'll be Mullet and Bass. Um, last year we had Perch, but that was on the 16th, but we're a day before this year. So Is that lure only? Lure only, yeah. Right. Cool, catching um, a mullet on a lure. That's going to be a bit of a challenge, isn't it? Everybody said it would be a challenge. Everybody caught. Right. It was relative. I mean, Christchurch was really easy for most people uh, this year. Uh, it, it was surprisingly easy for the mullet. Um, 6th of July for the chub. So that gives you half a, a couple of weeks to get find your chub spot in the, in the new season. And then finally, we're going to do a two day event um, on Anglian Water for the for the final. Uh, day one will be on Pittsford on the 28th of September. And then we all shift off to Grafham overnight on the, for the 29th. And then we'll fish the 29th of Sunday on the second day. So we can camp at Grafham, um, have a bit of food and a bit of drink there. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to put some food on for everybody um, and have a great final. I mean, it's going to be quite interesting fishing two venues as well, because again, the guys that can spend the time going out and practicing, they've now got to think about practicing on two venues, two very different venues as well. So what will the card be on Pittsford and Grafham? Have you decided yet? I haven't decided yet. It's, it's yeah. likely to be, um, Pittsford will probably be three pike, three perch uh, and one trout. And then it'll be three of each for Grafham. Will you include the trout Grafham? No trout, sorry. Three Xander, three pike, three, three, three perch, which is three a big pike. card for Grafham, a big yeah. card. But it gives gives the chance of almost seven metres of fish mm. the final day. Um, I was going to say, but, yeah, so let's, let's go. So is it overall length of all the competitions put together? All the top, yeah, so overall length for all of the events is what wins it for the overall. Wow. wow. So yeah. that's make it. That graph from is he? Uh, that is a bit of a joker in the pack, isn't it? Exactly. Um, yeah, yeah. Same um, as this year. It made yeah. it such a great event that uh, yeah. I mean, Richard. No one was expecting Richard to win overall, um, and he he just pulled it out of the bag. I mean, he had a, such a yeah. great day's fishing. Yeah, well, that's interesting. So length, okay. So that's so guys, you've heard it here from David. So we had a bit of a bit of a coup there with uh, the, the perch and chub cars. But obviously, other things he's gonna he's gonna let slip later on throughout the year as we go into the new year for all of this. But we've got the dates, and that would be really good. And I think also the fact that it's a two day at Pittsford and Grafham is a very good social as well. It allows um, yeah. everyone a bit of time to get to know each other, doesn't it? Particularly on the uh, on the so it'll be on the Saturday night. Is it going to be fish Pittsford leave get to Grafham set up camp? Yes, exactly. Yeah. 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 Have a bit of food, have some drink. Hopefully, Steve will have got some something organised at, at Grafham by that time. He'll probably be doing all of the the marshalling from uh, from Grafham during the day, so we can get set up. Um, and then, yeah, then hit nice Grafham with sore well. heads. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that could be a dangerous, couldn't it? The pub could get some takings that night. Oh, yeah, yes. I mean. <laughs> The WPC and uh, is has has been in previous years been some very sore heads in the morning for the second day. Same with Perch Mania and Xander Mania. Um, yeah, I think that's included in the boats as well as the the kayaks. People with very sore heads the following day. Oh, I come home just to charge batteries up, so I don't get involved with any of those shenanigans whatsoever. <laughs> but yeah. Uh, yeah, the only one you yeah. can't do that is at Pittsford. Because there's no food at the pubs, so there's no point in going. No, no, but you still go. We do but still we, go. Yeah, we won't talk about that, David, will we? <laughs> no, no, <laughs> that was a shocker this year. We'll keep that one quiet, Dave, won't we? Yeah, yeah, yeah. let's 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 move on quickly. Start <laughs> <warm in> here. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Well, I think we've um. You've, you've actually we, we've got all the dates everyone needs you've given a nice um history of the coyote tournament as well 
And uh, I'd like to get you back onto the podcast next year to give us updates with the Cody, if that's okay. As we go through, yeah, the, sure, no problem at all. Yeah, just trying to work out because we're going to change the dates, so we're going to do the podcast. Um, I don't want to go too, into too much more detail now because we've kind of hit all the main details that we've that we wanted to get out for the podcast. Um, yeah. I just want to say one thing, and that is, I said it once before, I'm going to say it again. A massive thank you to you and the other guys that organise comps as well, because. Um, in my old in, in my old life as a school teacher and organizing so many things for little things like for the school fixtures but big like uh week-long ski trips it is a, organizing anything what no matter what you do it whatever whatever genre it's in if it's for kayaks whether it's for school trips or if it's for local football teams i don't think people who organize events get enough thanks and enough praise from people it's one of my big things in life i know from personal experience it takes an awful lot of effort and it's not the pre-planning and organizing it is the execution on the day and it's also in the back of your mind you're always worried about the competitors the people that you organize the events for so i know you take part in these events but there's i know there's no way you can fully enjoy the experience because you always think about other people so yeah. from my point of view i just like to say thank you because it is a big ask so i just think um as as anglers we need to make sure we thank all the organizers for all these events because it just take a massive massive amount of energy so from my perspective thank you very much for doing those no, no problem at all i mean i wouldn't do it if i didn't enjoy it i know but it's still a massive ask it is huge yeah. so uh, yeah cool all right dave that's been absolutely fantastic thank you for your time and um guys if you've got any comments send them into the the, the youtube channel send them into the podcast but also if you need to get in contact with dave directly we touched on it once what's the best way to get in touch with you dave for people to find um, out about through, probably through facebook or or on uh yeah through facebook is easier so your I personal think. page or the yeah, personal, personal page is fine yeah david cool. morris on there well, you're gonna get bombarded yeah, yeah. the other <laughs> dave, one other thing andy yep. is that um on on anglers afloat there is a at pin to the top there is a list of all of the events throughout the year so it's not just coyote swka put on a couple of, well they put on three events four events oh, a okay. year um from wales swka uh there's the pits for grand slam which is the the event where the lures are supplied so you can't use any of your own lures um and then there's also gary's tournaments as well so as andamania perch mania wpc there that is good to know because things listed. Some a centralized point for competitions doesn't exist for boats. It does. Annoying. Well, at, that Daniel Salida set up a Facebook page. That's yeah. one you're going to talk about. But does he have everything on there? So he did. He did, he did this year. I'm pretty sure he had everything on there. So it's very difficult to find out what's going on, isn't it? So yeah. your angles are quite, You've got all the kayak events on there, by the sounds of things. Exactly. Yeah, they're all on there, including some of the shows as well. Oh, perfect. So, so there you go, guys. Yes. I shall certainly be um, following Dave's page, Anglers Afloat, because it's trying to get your calendar organised is a bit of a nightmare, but that's going to help massively. Brilliant. Yeah, Dave, I really appreciate your time. Thanks for your time today. No problem at all. Been a pleasure. Thanks. I'd just like to thank Dave for giving him his time for that piece. Um, big ask for these guys because I, I, I harass them via social media and messaging them and ask them for their time, and they eventually give in, and uh, I managed to get some, some time with them with uh, the magic of the internet. We haven't got time to waste on this week's podcast, so let's crack on. Let's get straight into Bradley Hunt. The Z-Man Rattlesnaker. I've got a new way now of getting our rattles into TPE baits. So this little device here, the Rattlesnaker, have got a storage compartment at the back here that holds our rattles in it. You've got the needle device and then attached to this back section here is a rod that runs down the needle to push the rattle into the plastic. You can see a little rod there that pushes up through the injector. And so you get your uh, TPE soft plastic, I'll stretch you on, and then we all know how much of a nightmare these are to put anything like the pointed nail weights or anything into let alone trying to get a rattle into the end so hence the injector take the front off like this see if focus on that okay the front comes off like this so you've got your rod and your injector separate stick your injector into where you want the rattle to go so i'm going to be putting it through 
this way so the rattle sits in the top end of the lure like so you take your rattle out of the little pop-up cap at number two Cap back. So you've got your rattle here. There is a tapered side and a round side. Just for just because it's my preference, I'm going to put the tapered side pointing down. I don't really think it matters which way round you do it. And then take your rod, follow it up, push it down. Remove your injector, and there we go. One rattling big TRD. Last but by no means least, we have Mr. Capollo, and I think he's got his passport with him because he's been up north. So uh, I don't know what the weather's been like up there. He tells me it's a little bit chilly. I think he's been out and about, but he might be a bit cold in this one. Okay, I thought I'd just jump on real quick and share a little bit of a secret with you. This is something I use fairly frequently, uh, especially because I'm very forgetful. I forget things all the time. Uh, this saves me in lots of different ways and on lots of different occasions. So anyone who's heard of fish finders has probably heard of Deeper. Now, Deeper are a castable sonar, which you can also use on boats with attachments and things like that. Uh, and, I, and I have one. I have a Chirp. Two, I think it's called, or Chuck Two Plus, whatever it is. Um, and it is very handy, especially when you're fishing from the bank and you want to map lakes and things like that. But I don't always bring it with me. And then this is one of those occasions when I actually did not bring it with me. So what do you do? Now, for an extra, I think it's about six or seven quid a month, you sign up to the premium membership of the Deeper, the Deeper app. And what that does, it gives you access to everybody else's maps. So everybody else who chooses to opt in and upload, upload their scans to the, the cloud or whatever deeper call it, um, it all congregates in these little community maps. Now that means because I've paid my premium, I can log on, I can have a look and I can see what other people have mapped and where they've been and what the depths are. It is the end of November, it's freezing cold, I've got a rough idea where those fish are going to be. The pike are probably going to be in the deeper water this time of year, uh, or at least moving towards it. Uh, it's unlikely they've been in a really shallow water. Never say never. But what I'm, I've got limited time. Days are short. I'm trying to eliminate water as best as possible. So I'm going to concentrate my time in the deep water. This app allows me to find, or this part of the app allows me to find the deep water really, really quickly without even having to map, map myself. So as you can see, the map we're looking at here, the left hand edge as we're looking at it is the shallow bank so that's about three and a half to maybe four and a bit foot uh, and that follows pretty much the whole length of the lake now come across to the right hand side of the lake and it's a totally different story now there is shallow areas but instantly with the the contours you can see on the map and the bathymetric chart you can see the deep area there is a definite difference here we've got about seven and a half maybe eight foot in this area right towards me and also it's got some really nice sharp drop offs so some sort of rocky outcrops and it drops off straight into the deep water i think that's where the pipe might be i could be totally wrong but what it does is it allows me to know that i'm fishing where i want to be fishing so it allows me to know that i'm fishing in deep water and i've had a couple of casts around with some jigs and things like that and it has it is deeper it's definitely deep here so I can trust the map. Uh, just a little secret I thought I'd jump on and tell you. Um, it's ha very handy for the extra six quid a month. Um, it saved me a lot of times. And uh, you know, like I said, I don't always bring a deep deeper with me. Uh, and this just gets you out of trouble. So hopefully that helps one or two of you. Right, guys, that's all we've got time for this week. Absolutely packed again. Let me know in the comments if you like this type of format. Format was the word I was looking for. Let me know in the comments if you like this type of format. We will keep mixing things up. We've got three more episodes to go until we end for this year. Need a bit of a rest because it's been um, a long, long series. So we're going to go up to probably second, third week in December and then have a break. But let me know what you think. And we're already compiling thoughts for season three. Right, guys. See you next week.